Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Again, welcome to uh, Berean Bible Church, Grace Life Church. Our P.O. Box is P.O. Box 6033, and we're in Evansville, Indiana. We're meeting at the YMCA 47719. And if you have any questions, uh, that's my phone number. You can text me. Got some interesting texts the last couple of weeks, mostly in regards to the message I did on, is there a gap between the rapture and the beginning of the tribulation? Uh, most of them positive, but a couple of negative ones. Um, but overall, um, a lot of views on that one too, a lot of views. But our website is gracelifeunleashed.com. Our YouTube site is Grace Life Unleashed by Dave Sigman. We're almost up to 100 subscribers, so uh, not that that's that big of a number, but we're, it, we've only been on YouTube for about a year and a half, so it's, and I think that's going to get more and more. Facebook is Grace Life Church and or Brian Bible Church, and our Rumble account is Grace Life Unleashed. We're going through Acts a little bit. We're not going through the whole book. We're, gonna, we're talking about an Acts 9 versus Acts 13, beginning of the body of Christ. And, and actually, Nick and I were texting each other this week, and, and one of the questions that came up was, is, is it really that important? All of these people are dead. You know, because we're talking about people that aren't around anymore, because that's really the people that it affected. Um, we're past Acts 28. Obviously, the kingdom program is totally set aside. So why is it that big of a deal? Well, it is because of things that were going on during that time and other books that Paul wrote in that particular time frame, and in particular, 1 Corinthians. And we're going to discuss that this morning in detail because it does matter, and I think it answers a lot of questions. Now, here's the problem. Um, 20 years ago, I was at a Bible conference, and somebody asked the speaker, can you explain the gap theory? And the speaker, who was a, a big name in the Grace Movement, explained the gap theory. And after he got done explaining it, I thought to myself, I have no clue what this guy just said. But that's not the gap theory. So this guy's interpretation of what the gap theory is, and for those who are wondering what the gap theory is, it's not the gap theory, it's the gap fact, you know, that there's a gap between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1, well, you have a problem with that? 1-2, <laughs> to me it's a done deal. And during that time period is when Satan fell and when the earth was actually judged and, and God recreated the organic earth when he put man on it. And, and it's, but this guy's like, well, that's, that's a time period when there were dinosaurs on the earth and before, and they're like, what are you even talking about? That's, that has nothing to do with that. So when someone says, I'm Acts 9, or someone says, I'm Acts 13, you're going to have to have them define it because a lot of times it doesn't mean what you think it means versus what they th think it means versus what I think it means, what someone else thinks it means. It's really complicated. So I'm going to explain it to you more than anything else. I used to be Acts 9. In fact, I think you're kind of born that way. And uh, I, I met an Acts 13er and uh, had him explain it to me and I told him he was crazy. And then a couple years later I came back and looked at it again and I've actually changed my opinion on it. Um, to understand the history of the Grace Movement, um, Charles Baker was Acts 13, and, and, and um, Stam was 9, and that's where the controversy was. In the same sense, Stam was 12 in, and Baker was 12 out. And, and so there's always been a little bit of controversy in regards to what's going on. And all of this plays together with this problem exactly what it means and what it doesn't mean. And so, as we are in Acts 9 here, and this is the verse we ended on last week, in Acts 9, verse 20, it says, And straightway he, that would be Paul, his name is now still Saul yet, though. Saul preached Christ in his synagogue, and what did he preach? He preached that he is the Son of God. And, and the point I was making last week was, that's not a good grace gospel, but that's a really good kingdom gospel. But at that point, that's all that Paul knew. Now, there are people that will tell me, Dave, 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 Dave. Paul didn't understand grace, but he was saved into the body of Christ at that moment. God just put him in there anyways. And I'm like, you can't do that. Well, God can do whatever he wants. And I, I understand that. But I, I, I don't believe that. And they say, well, Paul knew enough that he was saved. And again, and here's the problem. Something happened here in Acts 9. I, I'm, I'm going to tell you something happened. I believe, and this is my difference between my view and a lot of people, I believe Paul was saved into the kingdom program in Acts 9. Because that's all he knew. And grace was not revealed yet. And grace wasn't revealed until the next couple of verses here to Paul. And at that point, God moved him into the body of Christ. Because by the time Acts 13 comes along, there is a grace gospel. So when did it happen? 
But I don't think it happened in Acts 9, in the beginning here, when Paul was on the road to Damascus, because it, Paul didn't know enough. Now, is there a problem with Paul moving from the kingdom program to the body of Christ? A lot of people says there is. Now, this is a 12 in, 12 out issue, too. Um, there are people out there who teach good grace pastors, big name grace pastors, that teach when the grace movement started, everybody who was alive, all the kingdom saints, were moved into the body of Christ, whether they wanted to move or not. Boom, they're all there. That's the 12 in theory. That everybody's moved into the body of Christ. Well, then there's a modification of that. Everybody was moved except the 12. <laughs> like, show me a scripture verse. That's all I want, you know. And then we still have a problem with what's going on in the book of Acts. And that's where I think the problem comes in. Is like some of the things that's happening in Acts cannot be explained with those answers. Here's what the answer is. There were two churches going on side by side from basically Acts 13 up until Acts 28. And you could be saved into either one depending upon whether or not you've been pre-exposed to the kingdom program before or not. Or basically, if you were a Jew or not, okay? The Jews were pre-exposed. And I think anybody who was given the gospel between 9 and 28, if they were Jewish, were put into the kingdom program yet. So there were people that, but you didn't have a choice. It wasn't like, well, which one would you choose? Would you like to be in the body of Christ? Or would you, like, you, know, you didn't get that choice. It had to do with your background, basically, whether you're Jewish or not. And I'm going to show you that this morning. And it should bring you peace more than anything else, okay? So I think Paul, he's preaching a good kingdom message here. And all that heard him were amazed and says, Is not that he that destroyed them which called on this name? So this is something that they had heard before. And now they're saying, Hey, this guy used to be against this, and now he's for it. Well, is the grace message the same as the kingdom message? And the answer is, well, there's some similarities. Maybe they just didn't understand it well enough. No, there's a distinction between grace and kingdom. We're going to see that in Acts, Acts 13. Um, in Jerusalem, it came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests. So what Paul is doing here, or these people are saying here, is he used to be against it, and now he's for it. Now, Obviously, it's Jesus Christ is alive. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Jesus Christ is the Messiah. That's what Paul understood. I don't think that's even up for a debate. Um, Paul really believed that Jesus Christ was not alive. Paul really believed that Jesus Christ was not the Messiah. And I think in his mind, he believed that was all a fabricated story that he had resurrected from the grave. And so when Paul realized that, oops, this is the Messiah, this is the Son of God, it was a, a, a turning point in his life, more than anything else, I guess you could say. Now, between verses 21 and 22 in Acts 9 is a three-year gap. For those of you who like gaps. <laughs> and if you don't know that, it, it reads a little differently. Because it sounds like Paul just, boom, runs into you know, Damascus or, <clears throat> and, and starts talking to the people. Really, he disappeared for three years and came back. And it's like, well, what did he do for three years? Okay. Well, I think Paul went to school. Paul went to school and learned grace, okay? And I think God explained him what was going on in those three years. So, when did the body of Christ start? Did it start in Acts 9? Did it start at the end of Acts 9? Did it start in Acts 13? I know for sure it didn't start in Acts 2 or Acts 28. And if you read most grace doctrinal statements in most grace churches, it says we are a mid-Acts dispensational church. You know why it says that? It says that to make the 9 and 13 people get along with each other, okay? <laughs> That's why it says Because it doesn't matter, okay? This is not something that we're going to split over. This is not something we're going to get mad over. This is, but I think there, that there's something to be said in studying it, okay? And having said that, I'm probably more excited about it than you guys are. I think it's amazing. I, I think it, it answers more questions than it raises. In Acts 13, again, this is, this is where... where Paul says something that's definitely not grace, okay? First time Paul says something in Acts that's not grace is in, in chapter 13, okay? Paul says, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man it was preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, okay? No, that's like, well, that's, that's king to me. That is. But verse 39 isn't. And by him all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses, uh oh, them's fighting words. <laughs> okay, that's a grace issue because the kingdom program you could be justified by 
the law of Moses. You, it didn't work, but that's what the issue was more than anything else. Now, what happened in those three years? Well, we know from the book of Galatians. We know what happened. Now, we don't know what all happened. I don't think it took three years to teach Paul grace. All I know is Paul disappeared for three years, okay? It says in Galatians 1.11, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by of me is not after man. Now, the reason Paul is being very specific about that is because he wants to make sure that no one comes to the conclusion that Paul was hanging out with the Twelve and just getting a kingdom message. That this was something new and unique. Okay? For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, by the, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, what does that mean? That means Jesus told him, okay? Jesus was talking to Paul. Now, if you come up to me and you say, Dave, 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 I, I had a vision and a dream and a, a sign, and Jesus was talking to me. And this is your, hey, he talked to Paul. He can talk to me. What's the problem with that? It's not what Jesus is doing today. That's not under grace. That, that part of God's program is done. God is not doing signs and wonders. Today we have the completed word of God. So that God talks to you through your Bible, not like this, okay? <clears throat> For ye have heard of my conversation in times past in the Jewish or Jews religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited in the Jewish religion above my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. Paul's pretty much bragging, saying, I was better than the rest of them, and uh, <laughs> I went and gave 110%. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. Now, verse 15 is another one of those difficult verses, I think, to understand, because it almost sounds like, well, this is all predestined separated me from my mother's womb? Doesn't it sound like something that, that God had pre-planned way back for when he was born? I think it's another one of those references about being moved from the grace or the kingdom program into the body of Christ. It's a, kind of like being aborted from his appointed path. But it doesn't mean that God pre-planned this because otherwise the Calvinists are right and they're not right. Okay, What did he do? To reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Now, Paul is the second time he's like, I didn't talk to people, <laughs> okay? <laughs> it's like, why is that so important? <laughs> and the reason it's so important is because he wants the, the Galatians to understand this is not a kingdom program. This is something new. I didn't get this from Peter. I didn't get this from James. I didn't get this from the Twelve. This came from Jesus Christ himself. It's something different. That's why he says that. I'll be like, ah, you've been hanging around Peter. He didn't listen real close. No, he wasn't hanging around Peter. This came from Jesus himself telling him about this. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. So again, remember, if you read Acts 9, it looks like he, he's like in Damascus, and then he's in Damascus. Well, there's that gap in there of three years to where he goes back to Damascus. I don't know exactly why. Probably wants to go back to the place where he got in trouble. I don't know. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. So again, it makes Acts make a little more sense as far as what's going on and what's happening there. So basically what Paul is saying is, first I went to the desert for three years and I learned grace from Jesus. Then I went back to Damascus <clears throat> and then I finally went to Jerusalem to talk to Peter. Okay? And that's the timeline. But others of the apostles saw I none except James, the Lord's brother. Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before the Lord, before God, I lie not. Okay, now this, this James is going to be the James that Paul is going to run into later in Acts. That's now running the Jerusalem church and things there. Afterwards I came into the regions of Syria and Cecilia and was unknown by face unto the church of Judea, which were in Christ. Now again... What's basically saying is nobody in the kingdom program really understood who I was, which is it's true. That, okay. <clears throat> but they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preached the faith which once he destroyed. Well, then the question comes, well, what faith did he once destroy? And was it that Christ died on the cross for our sins, was buried and rose again? Was that the issue? 
I'm like, well, can you? no, it wasn't. <laughs> the issue was, is Jesus Christ the Messiah? Is Jesus Christ the Son of God? Remember last week I showed you? Christ was not crucified because of the miracles he did. Christ was not crucified because of all the good things he did, which is like, wow, they didn't care about that. He was crucified because he claimed to be God. And that was the point where they said, all right, you're a liar. We now need to stone you. And that's the point that Paul realized on the road to Damascus is, guess what? This is God. He is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. I do not think Paul understood the death, burial, and resurrection at that point. Okay? Like, well, he should have. No, I don't think he understood it. it it's a personal thing. Christ died for my sins. All that Paul understood was Jesus is alive. He didn't understand the sacrifice part. Now, may, maybe he did. Maybe I'm wrong. But the point is, this is not a good grace message in regards to what the context is telling us. Paul leaves Damascus for three years and then returns to Damascus again before going on to Jerusalem. Okay, So that's where that three-year gap comes in. So I do believe that Paul understood grace before he started preaching it. Like, oh well, yeah. Um, Janet's going through a new software program in her, in her hospital. I almost said church. Do you work at a church, Janet? <laughs> okay. In her hospital. And guess what? They're not using it yet. But you are, you're playing in the sandbox. That's the word she uses. They use all these cool words. She's learning it. Okay? So the program is there. It's available. But they haven't started using it yet. There's, are you still using your old system? Yes. Whoa. And all those records have to be transferred into the new one manually? Like, who's going to do that? People. <laughs> so Janet knows this new system. What day is the switchover? 16th of July. Yeah, see, good. So, <laughs> there's a few bugs in the system. <laughs> 16th of July, they're switching over. So, God's teaching Paul grace and says, Paul, this is a new program. We're still under the old program. But come Acts 13, I'm going to tell you, and we're going to switch over to the new program. Is that unfeasible? Nope. I don't think it is. I don't think it is at all. Okay. So, thank you for letting me use you as an illustration. I appreciate that. So, <clears throat> all right, 22. A three year gap, now we're here. But Saul, and again, do you think the Holy Spirit uses things on purpose? Do you know when Saul's name is changed to Paul in Acts? Acts 13. Does that mean anything to you? Eh, yeah, maybe a coincidence. But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwell in Jerusalem, proving what? Proving that this is very Christ. No, that, that, that's not even good English, and I'm not even good at English. Um, proving that, that Jesus was the actual Christ. Now, is that a good grace message, that Jesus is the Christ? Remember Peter's confession? Thou art the Christ, or the Messiah, the Son of the living God. That's what Peter said. And Christ was like, good answer, Peter. Bad grace answer. So, so again, I'm, I'm being picky, and I'm being picky on purpose, because even when we talk to people, I run into people all the time that tell me they believe in Jesus and they believe in God. Oh, I believe in Jesus. I believe in God. You're still going to hell. <laughs> okay? Satan believes in God and Jesus and he's going to hell. Okay? Just understanding who God is, understanding Jesus does not save you. And there's a lot of people that have that false hope because they haven't personalized it. Like, what do you mean? Personalized it. Do you believe that Christ died on the cross for your sins? That's personalizing it. <laughs> yes. And the answer is yes. If you believe that, you're saved. You don't have to walk up front. You don't have to be baptized. That all happens all by itself. Well, the walking up front doesn't. The baptism oh, it happens all by itself. That's the grace message. Paul is not telling these people here that Christ died on the cross for their sins, was buried, and rose again. But he's given them a really good kingdom message. And that's important. And after that, many days were fulfilled. The Jews took counsel to kill him. Which Jews are these? The, 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 the small, the little flock? Those who believe Christ was inspired? Are these the ones that he was trying to kill when he went to Damascus? No, it's the people he used to work for. <laughs> okay? Yeah. Don't you hate it when your former boss wants to kill you, Scott? Don't you just hate that? <laughs> I, I just shouldn't have gone there. This, this, uh, I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, 
So that's what happens when I don't have notes. See, stuff comes out of my head that gets me in trouble. But, but their lying await was known of Saul. These guys played pretty nasty, okay? They wanted to kill him. In fact, that's going to be their goal pretty much for the rest of their lives and, and the rest of Paul's life. And the reason Paul ends up in prison is because they almost got away with it. And Paul saw what they were going to do, and he took the, the alternate route to appeal to Caesar so that these guys wouldn't kill him. That's how serious these guys were. They wanted to kill him. And after lying away, it was known of Saul. And they watched the gate day and night to kill him. You know, this is not like, let's just beat him up and make him learn his lesson. This is actually, we want him dead. And the thing about it is, do you think that maybe they've done this before to other people? Yep. Yeah, I think this was a nasty group of people. And I think Saul knew how they played for keeps, too, because he used to be part of that group. Many people disappeared for the sake of religion back then, I think. Then the disciples took him by night and led him down by the wall in a basket. He snuck out of town more than anything else. Now, we also have this 12 in, 12 out issue, and all this plays into effect. This has more to do with, with what's going on than anything else. One theory is everyone who was alive when the body of Christ started was moved into the body of Christ. Now that presents a problem, because again, also now we have the 12 disciples in the body of Christ. And the standard answer is, well, God can separate them out again. That's not a problem. God went through all this work of distinct, distinguishing these two programs, and now he's going to just lump them all together. <laughs> what a waste of time. And that's why I don't even believe today that kingdom saints are in heaven. I believe they're still waiting in Abraham's bosom. I don't believe Christ went down to the center of the earth and gathered them up and took them to heaven. I think he went down there to say, hey, we won. And uh, he left them there. And when it says he led captivity captive, it's not talking about kingdom saints. I think Christ went up to heaven, but I don't think he took the kingdom saints with him. I think they're still waiting. The body of Christ is in heaven. And again, the same answer is, no, when, when Christ comes back to set up his kingdom, all the armies of God, that's the kingdom saints, and they come from heaven. And I'm like, no, it's not. Those are angels. That's the body of Christ. No, we're not, we're not involved in that either, okay? That's not what's going on. Um, or everyone except the 12 were moved into the body of Christ when the body started. It's like, okay. Why can't everyone stay where they are, okay? Two programs going on at the same time. And this is something I haven't heard a lot of pastors talk about. Why can't we have the kingdom program, which is declining? I'll give you that going on at the same time as the body of Christ is, and I'm going to use the word ramping up. I don't think there was a ramping up of the body of Christ. I think it was boom, in place. Okay? But after Acts 28, the door closed on the kingdom program. In other words, nobody had any opportunity to join the kingdom church after Acts 28. They had to become a member of the body of Christ. It was kind of like, we've got to have a deadline at some point. There's your deadline, okay? And, and I have... I actually have precedence for that. You know that? <laughs> We're going to look at that. But first, I want to look at this. Dare any of you have a matter against another? Now, Paul here in 1 Corinthians is talking to the Corinthian church. I believe the Corinthian church was full of kingdom saints and full of body of Christ saints. But I think there were more kingdom saints than there were body of Christ saints. But either way, we had two groups that were together. Now, Sometimes grace people can't get along with each other without getting along with a kingdom saint, okay? But, and that was some of the problem in the kingdom, or in the Corinthian church. But listen to how Paul words this, okay? So the issue is that they're taking their problems to the outside world, okay? Um, you know, Nick wants to, to go after Denny for assault, and we're like, Nick, 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 Denny didn't mean it. And like, yes, he did. He was trying to hurt me. And so now he, he gets a restraining order against Denny. You're a violent man, Denny. And, and, the, <laughs> and so all right, he says, sorry. Now, that doesn't, but that doesn't make it better. You're hurt emotionally forever. You know that, Nick? Uh, I'll, you and me, I'll get a lawyer for you. <laughs> So the board sits Nick down and sits Danny down and says, guys, we're not going to take our dirty laundry and take it out into the world. And people say, you grace people are crazy, which they think that already. We don't want to let, can't you guys just say you're sorry and get along with it, which and it was all in fun and games. But, and I'm using that example, which I probably should know. But the, the point is this, they were taking their dirty laundry and taking it to the outside world 
and they were looking like idiots. So what Paul is saying here is, dare any of you have a matter against another, go to law before the unjust. You're taking your, your issues to a bunch of unsaved people and having them solve them. How crazy. And not before the saints. In other words, talk to a fellow Christian. And this is his precedence. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? Now, you get to that verse and you're like, well, yeah, he's talking about all of us. Okay, no, he's not. He's talking about the kingdom saints, which was one group within the, in, in that group. And if the world shall be judged by you, he, he says you there. It doesn't say us. He says you, because he's talking to the kingdom saints, and Paul's not part of the kingdom program. Are ye unworthy to judge the smaller matters? Okay, and then in verse 3 he says, don't you know that we, now we have the saints, and we have we shall judge angels. Hmm. Is, is we part of the, of the you? <laughs> and I look at that and go, no, that's two groups of people. But Paul is saying, hey, kingdom saints, you guys are going to be, and the word judge there does not mean judge like in guilty or innocent. It means rule. The kingdom, is going to, the kingdom saints are going to rule the earth, and the body of Christ is going to judge angels. Now, by judge, it doesn't mean guilty or innocent. That's been done already. You guys know that? All the fallen angels have been judged. And what's their punishment? Do you guys know what's the punishment for being a fallen angel? Lake of fire. Okay. Um, so that judgment's done. <laughs> okay. So what are you going to stand up there and go, uh, we're part of the appeal program? No. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was misjudged. I forget it. Everybody in prison thinks the same thing. All right. What does the word judge mean? It means rule. And, and Paul is saying is the body of Christ is actually above angels as far as power and authority goes. That the body of Christ is going to be in charge of the angels. We're not lower than the angels, which we are now. And once we get to heaven, we're going to be above them because the body of Christ is on the same level as Jesus Christ himself. But I see two groups of people here. And, and a lot of people don't see that. And I look at it and go, well, no, it sounds like he's talking about two groups of people. And he is. And that's because there were two groups in that church. There were kingdom saints and there were body of Christ saints. Now, that's the least of my problems. The problems I see is kingdom saints had physical, spiritual gifts. You know that? They could speak in tongues, and, and they could do prophecy, and they had all these gifts. Does the body of Christ get any of those gifts? No. Nope. In fact, and I have yet to find a, a grace person to tell me I'm wrong, Timothy had a spiritual gift. Paul said, hey, you were, we laid hands on you, Timothy. You have a gift. Did he ever say that to Titus? Oh, well, Timothy was a kingdom saint. You guys know that? Timothy learned salvation from his mother and his grandmother before Paul showed up. Uh, you think they learned grace or kingdom? I think it's kingdom. And so Timothy had some kingdom characteristics. Paul was saved in the kingdom program. He had all the signs and wonders. Now they faded away, as they did for everyone. But yet Titus didn't have anything. In fact, Paul didn't write to Galatians and say, hey guys, let's talk about spiritual gifts. He didn't write to Ephesians because they didn't, they weren't part of the kingdom program, but this church had those kingdom saints in it, and they brought all their touchy-feely things with them, okay? Acts 18, after these things, Paul departed from Athens and Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pompous, later came from Italy, which his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. So Paul runs into Aquila and Priscilla, and they are saved because they were kicked out of Rome. You think they were kingdom saints or Jewish? Kingdom saints or body of Christ saints? Well, they were obviously kingdom saints that were part of the kingdom program. And they came to help Paul, okay? And because they, he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought for by their occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. Okay, well that's important, right? And when Silas and Timothy were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. Okay, now this is Acts 18. Paul runs into the synagogue and he tells the Jews what? Jesus is the Christ, okay? Now again, you got to start somewhere, Dave. I understand that. And that's where they were at. Because in their mind, who was Jesus? Uh, fake, an imposter. Um, they had no trouble saying Jesus was a rabbi and a teacher. They really didn't have any problem with that. But when he claimed to be God, 
or the Christ, that's when they're like, we're not going there. So Paul is persuading them. Now, again, he's like, well, that was just a means to the end. Let's say these people believed. Were they put into the kingdom program? He's obviously talking to the Jews, it says there. He testified to the Jews. After Acts 9, after Acts 13, were these people put into the kingdom program or were they put into the body of Christ? Now, some people say, well, it didn't matter. They were put into the body of Christ because they had no choice. That's the only program that was available. I say no. I say up until Acts 28, they were put into the kingdom program. And when they had opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood is upon your own heads. I am clean, for henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. So this is kind of like God telling the Jews what's going on. And there's three times where Paul basically says that. And this is what happens. And he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshipped God. And here's the issue. Paul came out of the synagogue and he went to this guy's house, whose house was joined hard to the synagogue. Now, those aren't words that we use too much anymore. You know what that means? First of all, we have a church split. <laughs> That's what it means. Same wall. Paul went... What was that? Zero law. There you go. Yeah, no law in the cut. <laughs> Paul went next door and started a grace church, let's say. Now, did anybody follow him? Any of these kingdom saints? Well, a lot of them did, I think. Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house. Again, it doesn't sound like a grace message. And many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Now, of course, we know that's, that's, that's spiritual baptism, right? <laughs> it's, a wet. It's, it's a wet spiritual baptism? <laughs> well, maybe they didn't get it yet. No, they got it, because under the kingdom program, were you water baptized? Yes. Or you weren't saved, okay? Well, maybe they just didn't, under no, they understood, Okay. That's why I think in Acts 13 is the only thing that makes sense. And basically having two programs is the only thing that makes sense. Because now you understand. Because even, remember the Philippian jailer? You know, he was going to kill himself because he thought Paul had, had escaped. And uh, you know what they did to that guy? They water baptized him. Hmm, I don't know. <clears throat> then spake the Lord to Paul in a night by a vision. Be not afraid, but speak and hold not by peace. And God's just encouraging uh, Paul to hang in there, okay? All right, John 14. I know we're jumping around, but I'm setting a lot of precedence here. <clears throat> John 14, 23. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come un unto him and ma make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father which sent me. The Corinthian church probably had more kingdom saints in it than grace saints. I'm like, what? Well, especially in the beginning, because they came from next door. <laughs> okay? Now, why is that important? Nowhere in Scripture did Paul ever say, Kingdom saints, you're now part of the body of Christ. I want you to give up all your kingdom stuff and quit looking at the law and start becoming a good grace believer, and I want you to start eating pork. Did Paul ever say that? Never once. Never once. Well, well, maybe he didn't want to offend them. No, never. He, he, God never said that. He allowed them to continue on with the kingdom program, even past Acts 28. Now, no one was added after Acts 28, but those people continued on until they died. They always had a kingdom hope. And then you have to understand that. But Paul here is going to minister to both groups in the same building. It explains a lot what's going on in, in the letter to the Corinthians. He's writing some of it to the kingdom saints and some of it to the grace saints because they're not getting along too well, okay? God never told the Jews to switch over to grace. They stayed in the kingdom. They stayed kingdom saints forever. Now, Acts 21. Is Acts 21 pretty far into the book of Acts, would you agree? <laughs> and when he was come to Jerusalem, the brother received him gladly. And the following day Paul went in with us unto James and all the elders were present. Now this is James, Christ's half-brother. Okay, This is when Paul gets arrested and, and basically has to flee for his life almost. Okay, So Paul shows up in Jerusalem later on in his ministry and when he had saluted them he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. Notice he says his. I think that's grace. 
And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of grace. Right? <laughs> it's just a misprint. <laughs> you know what? James says, guys, look at all these thousands of Jews that are still zealous for the law. And Paul doesn't say a word. Was he being polite? No, he was being dispensationally correct. They were still on that program. In fact, Paul voluntarily, and this bugs me, he voluntarily puts himself back under the law, which as a grace believer you can do. You know that? But don't make me. You know, if you want to, I know grace people that say, the food laws work, they're healthier for you. And guess what? They're probably right, okay? Because when God does things, it usually makes sense. But I kind of like bacon, all right? <laughs> So if you want to not eat bacon, and you don't, although I really don't like shrimp that much. Danny, you probably like shrimp, but under the law, you can't eat those. Those are bottom feeders. Those are sickly animals. Don't eat those bottom feeders. You know? <laughs> if you want to put yourself back under the food laws, more power to you. It's grace. But don't tell me I have to. And when Paul is doing there, he's like, hey, cool, you guys are zealous for the law. Praise the Lord. And he voluntarily puts himself back under the law because he knew the law. You remember he shaved his head and he did this vow thing? He never said we should do that, but he did it. I, I know why I think he did that? To show the Jews that God was still in their program. That's, right. That's why. Not because, oh, grace people should be shaving their heads and doing vows. That's not what he's doing. Again, under the law, under grace, you can, you, you're free to do what you want. You know? And people, I mean, some of the things the law had are pretty practical. You know that? <laughs> they really are. Um, <clears throat> Verse 21. And they were informed of thee that thou hast teach us. Now this is important. This is what this is hearsay, okay? <laughs> is hearsay admissible in court? Okay? <laughs> this is something I've heard in the news. Rob, you know what I'm talking about. You know, if somebody tells you that somebody told them that somebody told them that somebody told them, that's hearsay, okay? The president grabbed the wheel. We, that's hearsay. All right. And they were informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses. Did Paul ever do that? No. no. But that's what the rumor was back in Jerusalem. And that's why people read that and go, oh, see, they were supposed to be under grace. No, that's what was hearsay, okay? Saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. Again, as under grace, you betcha. Under the kingdom program, circumcise your kid. And Paul is going to talk to him. okay? What is it, therefore, the multitude must need come together, for they will hear that thou art come. Paul's going to get a chance to explain himself. I don't know if he ever did, but I'm sure he would set the record straight. Guys, you continue doing what you're doing. You see how Acts makes so much more sense when you look at it this way? Versus, oh, no, these were grace people, and they just didn't know it. And so Paul needed to explain to them, yes, get rid of the law. That's not what he's doing. He's actually giving them a, a right hand of approval more than anything else, okay? All right, John 14. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. This is Christ talking. He's talking to the twelve. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. This is a promise that Jesus gave to the twelve, that they didn't have to take notes. You know that? Imagine being in school where it's like, I don't have to study because the Holy Spirit's going to give me the answers. Does that work under grace? <laughs> You want to talk about name it and claim it? I would love to name it and claim it. I don't need to worry. God's going to give me the answers. Uh, no, what does Paul say? Study to show thyself approved unto God. How did Paul learn? Did Paul, you know, did a zip drive come out of heaven and again Paul just popped it in his head and yeah, I know it all, you know. The 12 had it a lot easier. Paul had to learn it the old-fashioned way. God told him, okay? So important. How many remember this picture? I found the color version. You think that's actually how it was? <laughs> Dick, you were around when that picture was taken. <laughs> no? Oh, all right, okay. <laughs> no? This supposedly is the, the Lord's Supper, the Passover meal, the, you know, whatever you want to call it. This started out as the Passover meal, and then Christ added something to it. You remember that? Okay. They, how often did they do the Passover meal? You guys remember? Once a year. Once a year. 
it was a type of basically death, burial, and resurrection. If you put the blood on the doorpost, the, the death angel passed over you. And they, they were constantly being reminded of that, okay? 1 Corinthians 11, Paul is talking about this meal. Now the question here, and this is where I think it's important, who was he talking to? Were we ever told under grace that we should practice the Passover meal? No. In fact, how many works do we have under grace? None. How many rituals? How many sacraments? None. How many does the kingdom saints have? How many do you want? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Now, the original Passover meal did not have the discussion that Christ had his disciples at the end where he took the cup and the bread, right? That was added, all right? And um, we're going to see what was added. When you come together, therefore, unto one place is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Now, how often do you think they ate the Lord's Supper? Probably once a year. It was full of kingdom saints, okay? This is the Passover meal, okay? For in eating, everyone taketh before others his own supper, and one is hungry and another is drunken. No, this was abuse, okay? That's not what the... They should have done it as a group, and that one group had a lot, and, and one group didn't have any. What have ye not houses to eat and to drink in, or despise ye the church of God, and shame them that have not? So some people had a lot, some people had nothing. Um, they, they claim if you ever actually have the Passover meal, it's kind of a blah meal, because it doesn't have a lot of um, spices, and it's just a bland meal, because it's a meal they had before they, they went out into the wilderness. Um, Shame them that have not. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? I praise you not. Okay, now, Paul, these next words are very interesting. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. Now, this is interesting. Was Paul present at the Last Supper that Christ had with his 12 disciples? No. no. Did Paul really ever probably talk about it a whole lot? You know, maybe he did. I don't know. But did Paul understand what happened at the end of the Lord's Supper in regards to how it affected kingdom saints. Because this whole issue of the wine and the bread is a kingdom issue. It has to do with the New Covenant. Is the New Covenant have anything to do with the body of Christ? Well, not really. It has to do with Israel, right? It's a Jewish thing. All right, so Paul says, God told me this. And the reason God told him was because otherwise he wouldn't have known it. He wasn't there, okay? For I did receive the Lord that which also I learned you. All right, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he had, was betrayed, took bread. This is this issue of the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this remembrance of me. Now, that sounds great. And, I, and when we do it as grace people, I think this is the most humbling. This is the most... This, it reminds us of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. As a grace believer, you can do this as many times as you want. It doesn't bother me a bit. But I think a lot of people try to make it part of the rules. I know a lady that thinks she's not saved because she hasn't had the Lord's Supper in a while. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Okay, now she's not a grace believer. She's, she's from a different religion. And in their religion, she probably isn't because of that, but she's not saved if she has it either. But uh, the same matter also, he took the cup, which he had supped, saying, this is the cup, is the what? New Testament. Uh-oh. Is that a kingdom word or is that a grace word? Grace. That's, that's a kingdom word. <laughs> New covenant. Oh. So do we as grace people worship the new, or care about the new Co the new covenant fixes the old covenant. It's a fix for Israel. Okay, this is this is Jewish. Okay, the new covenant in my blood. This dewy is off as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now again, as grace believers, we can do whatever we want. But I think what Paul is doing here is he's explaining to these kingdom saints in the Corinthian church what's the purpose of the Passover meal and why it's not just a feast and why it represents the new covenant. And that's why, if, if you know me, I'm not big on, you know, we need to do the Lord's Supper every quarter. We probably should do it a little more because some of you want to. But the point is this, it's not required for salvation. In fact, if you really understand grace, it almost seems like there's no way it's required for salvation. It's, it, it just seems wrong, okay? 
Well, if this is a kingdom thing, it makes a lot of sense, okay? Because it's adding to the kingdom promise and pointing out the fact that Christ ushered in the new covenant. And he did. And that's what's going on there. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. And again, I have no problem with that. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthy. Now, what does that mean? Sinner. Sinner, yeah. Are you outing yourself there? <laughs> yeah. Shall be guilty of the blood, the body, and the blood of the Lord. Well, what does that mean? That means you're not appreciating it. You're not understanding what Christ did for you. And that's not so bad. The next verse is scary, okay? <laughs> but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthy eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And it's like, if you're not right with God, and you take the Lord's Supper, you're in trouble, buddy, because what's the trouble? For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and some sleep. God. No, it says sleep. They take naps. <laughs> okay. So those of you who are tired... <laughs> Is God killing people that are not living right? According to this verse, he is. You know why? It's a kingdom verse. But that's in 1 Corinthians, Pastor. He can't be a kingdom verse. He's talking to kingdom saints. Was God doing stuff like that back then? I think so. Now, again, I don't, I don't think God wanted to kill people. I think he was getting their attention when they were weak and sickly. And if they still didn't shape up, because that's how the law works. So it's like, oh, no, pastor, that's not a grace first. Yes, if, they, if you want to make the first half grace, you better make the second half grace. You can't pick and choose. This is still the same context. So there are some pastors that will say, for those of you, before we do Lord's Supper, if you're not right with God, don't take it. Well, I've got to give them more credit, because they understand what this verse says. Is God judging people today under grace and making them sickly? Is he making them sleep or be weak? No, no, no. Well, I know people who are sickly and weak and tired. I'm one of them once in a while. <laughs> it's not grace, people. Okay? Yeah, old age. <laughs> that, that's not God. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's not God. And, and again, that's why people are like, oh, no, Dave, God, if you look at verse like this, God is actively judging and chastising people. It's because they look at these verses because they don't rightly divide. No, it's in Corinthians. He's talking to the kingdom saints in the church in Corinth. Didn't I just make your life a lot better? I think I did. I'm getting tired just doing that. <clears throat> All right, then we're going to stop at this. Uh, I have like 39 slides today. There's no way we're getting through them. This is my other proof text, and we're going to stop after this, proving that kingdom saints were added to the kingdom way after Acts 9 and way after Acts 13. In Acts 19, Paul is running around and says, And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. So Paul's, you know, cruising around. He runs into these disciples. Like, hey, cool. Praise the Lord. He said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Now, no one has ever asked me that since I've been saved. Ever, ever. Hey, you believe the Holy Ghost? Okay. <clears throat> That's because I think Paul knew what was going on. And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there will be a Holy Ghost. What are you talking about, Holy Ghost? What's the Holy Ghost? Okay. And he said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? Okay, so obviously there's some context here we're missing, but obviously they said they were baptized. And they said, unto John's baptism. Now, how many of you know what John's baptism is? What's John's baptism? Repent and be baptized. Or change your attitude and be baptized. Were those people saved? Yeah. Yeah, they were saved. Grace program or kingdom program? Kingdom. That's the easy one. You guys had that one before I even asked you, right? So these obviously are people who have been pre-exposed to the kingdom program and they're Jews, so they, they fit my, my, you know, law of first exposure. So now, is Paul going to give them a grace message, or what's he going to do? Because that's always, because I mean, this is Acts 19, folks. This is way down the road. If you want to say that everybody was put into the body of Christ, you got a problem with these verses. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is Jesus Christ. Okay, John was a forerunner to Christ, and they needed to be the Christ. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Okay, now they were brought up to the baptism of the Lord Jesus. This is still water. This is still kingdom. There's no grace in here at all. 
And when he had laid hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Bad grace doctrine. Okay, did you guys, when you were saved, did you speak in tongues? And, well, that means you didn't have the second blessing, folks. No, kingdom all the way. Kingdom all the way. That's a kingdom gift. And the purpose of tongues was for evangelism. The purpose of prophecy was to bring people up to speed in what's going on more than anything else. Um, we'll stop right there. I believe that these disciples were saved in the kingdom program. Yeah, um, no question. Uh, it, it, some pastors have a big problem with that. What's wrong with having two programs going on at the same time? Uh, nothing at all. Um, uh, it, it explains the problems going on in Corinthians that a lot of people can't explain. It explains the issues going on in Acts a lot of people can't explain. Uh, having Paul saved in the kingdom program and moving the body of Christ doesn't create any problems. It actually solves problems. Um, Paul had all the sign gifts the kingdom people had, um, and he used them, but those faded away too. He lost them. Uh, you think if anybody should have kept them, Paul should have. But the program was being set aside. So the thing of it is, and the discussion I had this week with this guy was, yes, these people are dead. <laughs> They're all dead. <laughs> We're not talking about them. But it explains what's going on in Acts as we read it. It explains what's going on in Corinthians when we read it, that Paul was trying to minister to these people. And even this issue of all these, these gifts these guys had in, in Corinthians, you know, they could prophesy, they could speak in tongues, you know, they, they could do miracles. Um, like, wow, this church had all kinds of cool people in it, but they were misusing them, and that's what the problem was. And uh, that, that's wrong. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Bible. Lord, we thank you we can understand it. I know at times, Lord, it gets confusing, and I realize some of the stuff I said this morning was, was fairly deep in the sense of difficult. And we pray, Lord, for, for wisdom to understand it. Again, we thank you for salvation in Christ. Lord, you did all the work when you died on the cross for our sins. All we have to do is believe. You died for our sins, you were buried, and you rose again. I pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you, folks.